You are watching Breakthrough News, and this is the Freedom Side Live. I am one of your hosts, Eugene Perrier, here alongside, as always, my co-host, Rania Kalik. Rania, great to be back with you. Good to be back on with you, Eugene. Well, thank you very much. I, you might say it's my pleasure. And, of course, just want to remind people who are watching us here on YouTube that you hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you can get the alerts, so you can be following everything we're doing here at Breakthrough News, both tonight, where we have a great show for you, and moving forward. We, of course, will be touching on a range of things. Of course, we're going to be touching on the ongoing crisis in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. We'll be getting some views from the African continent, so very excited about that. Just, again, to see how it is... Things are seen outside of the Western media bubble a lot of us are unfortunately trapped in. We're also going to be talking about the row happening in the island of Jamaica over slavery reparations, the Commonwealth, the Queen, many different elements of that. And then we will also discuss the Supreme Court hearings, the ongoing Supreme Court hearings happening here in the United States. And we'll, in addition on Ukraine, we're also going to get some some commentary from Germany, which should be fantastic. So we've got a lot here for you, both on Ukraine, on the Caribbean, on the Supreme Court. It's a packed show, so hit subscribe, hit the bell, so you generally are following us here on Breakthrough News, and you still have opportunity to tell other people you know that we're going live here now. And I just want to remind people, as we did last week, that we also have a Telegram channel here at Breakthrough News Now. We are now on Telegram, trying to reach you wherever you may be, so you can see there at the bottom of the screen there, Telegram, at Breakthrough News. So definitely check us out, join our Telegram channel, all of our regular content, updates on breaking news events, and the like, all there for you. So plenty for you here, plenty for you there, and of course we're at BT Newsroom across all of your social media platforms. And I just want to throw one thing out there, Eugene, is Please. we are now at 96,000 YouTube followers. So nice. if you have not subscribed yet, you do that immediately. All on top of hitting the like button, make sure you are subscribed to Breakthrough News because we're so close to hitting that 100,000. It's a nice <laughs> mark. Maybe we'll do something to celebrate. Yeah. You can also mm -hmm. post in the Super Chat, make a donation in the Super Chat. And if Rania, who determines what gets read out, says that your comment can be read, it will indeed be read. So... I don't know what criteria she uses, so do your best. But I'm that's maybe a anything. reason to put more money in the Super Chat to test it out. Yeah. To see what can get through and what doesn't get through. <laughs> Indeed. So, Eugene. Yes. There's something that I feel like we need to talk about before we get on with the show. Please. And that is that? There, was a, there, was, there was a very important death mm. that we should commemorate, and that is the death of former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Yes. Uh, she was the first woman secretary of state, which mm. I'm supposed to be very happy about, even though she said that anybody who or women who don't vote for Hillary Clinton, ha there's a place in hell for us. Oh, I um, forgot but, about that, right? Yeah, yeah. There's always one you've forgotten about, and that's one yes. of them. Um, but uh, may she rest in peace. There's also something else that she is well known for, yeah. um, and that is that is. It's actually not funny. I, I just, I don't know how else to look at this, but with a sense of humor. But back in the 90s, mm -hmm. people may remember that there was uh, sanctions on the country of Iraq. That was, were, there were sanctions, international sanctions led by the United States, basically formulated by the United States, that essentially starved that country for about 13 years. And back in the late 90s, when she was still in the Clinton administration, uh, it was, it came out by, I think, Save the Children, had estimated that something like at that point, 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five had died from starvation as a result of those sanctions. That's half a million children under the age of five. Now, I know they're not blue eyed and blonde haired, but they're just as important as the children that everybody cares about today. Uh, so I just want to point that out because back in the 90s, she was on 60 Minutes and she was asked about those sanctions. And whether that 500,000 death price, as it was framed, was worth it. And I think that we should show that clip. I know a lot of people have been seeing this floating around social media, but I think it's essential to show that clip as much as possible. So do we have it? Can we show it? We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? 
I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Wow. So, I mean, you, in some ways, you can kind of almost appreciate the honesty because you don't often get that level of straightforwardness from U.S. officials. But at the same time, that's such a monstrous thing to say. I mean, you're basically saying that, that you're saying 500,000 children don't matter. Like their yeah. lives do not matter. It's okay. They starve to death. Yeah. And it's, and it's sort of like worth it for what? I mean, to destroy the country of Iraq. I mean, the, the, the point has to be made is that the sanctions did not do what they were alleged to be to do. I mean, obviously, the sanctions that were happening then, Operation Desert Fox, that would come in the late 90s where we started bombing Iraq again, the no-fly zone in the northern and southern parts of the country. I mean, all of these things we were told at that time were supposed to, uh, you know, erode the regime of Saddam Hussein, the evil dictator, that he was going to fall, he was going to be pushed out, there are going to be popular uprisings against him, and none of these things happened. The only real clear legacy of those sanctions were these 500,000 dead children, the complete and total destruction of the state of, you know, so many different aspects. Uh -oh. I mean, a country what that happened? had advanced educational system, medical system, first country in the Middle East to do an open heart surgery. I mean, all of this was basically gutted in the context of the sanctions against Iraq in the 90s. So it's sort of like the price is worth it. And it's a, it's a hell of a statement to make because when you look at what, A, what they were trying to do, and then B, what it actually accomplished, how could you say that? I mean, it really is stunning when you think about it, when you in, in all that context, I mean, on its own, it's stunning. But with that context, it's just wow, wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know really what else to add beyond what you just said. And I mean, the ramifications of those sanctions stunted an entire generation in so many ways. And then after that, the U.S. invaded and occupied the country, and you know, just the terror that has been inflicted on Iraq for the last thirty years is unimaginable, and I think unquantifiable. Um, at this yeah. point. And we just don't talk about it. We pretend it never happened because we've moved on to, you know, waving Ukrainian flags. Yeah. I mean, shout out to Tom Saltzman, by the way, made a little donation there in super chat, no comment. So you're safe. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it really, it, there was, we're always in sort of a crisis du jour kind of reality. You know what I'm saying? Like it's whoever the big dictator is just takes over everything. You know, it's Saddam, it's Milosevic, it's Putin. It's whoever, you know, they need to target the most that week. Then is everything is, is pushed on there. And yeah, I think Madeleine Albright's legacy was, I mean, I, for many of us, I think obviously we are aware of many of these things, but I would argue that her legacy was essentially untarnished in the United States by any of this. And I'm just saying that judging based on the response we have gotten that has been totally laudatory, you know, as you noted, noting, you know, that she had made some historic first from the point of view of the personnel of the U.S. government, uh, some of her background, of course. Uh, you know, and how she came to the country and other things like that. But, you know, no real serious digging down on her record, which is, I guess, not that surprising because I guess who in the sort of history of the country who is, you know, well known to have done war crimes is in any way, shape or form ever held accountable to any degree. I, I really wish I could remember who said this, but someone said this, maybe it's just someone random said it to me. Uh, once, but they said, you know, in the United States, the more people you're responsible for killing, the less likely you are to be held accountable. Like if you just right. kill someone on the street, oh, there's a chance that you might be tried and convicted. But if you're responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of people, millions of peoples in wars, you're actually going to be lauded and held up as some hero figure. Well, yeah, especially if you're a Western leader, <laughs> that's a hundred percent for sure. Um, you know, I do just want to make like a comment about you know, everything, this is the kind of moment we're in right now. I'm really glad that we have this platform at Breakthrough News to break through, if you will. All of you mentioned at the beginning, all of this like propaganda. Yeah. Um, and it's just got, it's gotten so bad where there's just this like propaganda bubble in the West where you, you can't see or hear uh, or read um, like anything, even if you try, like I, I'm, in, I'm in Lebanon. I can't, I don't, you know, I can't always access RT.com just to see what they're posting right. on their page. Um, you know, I was told that the U.S. ambassador in Jordan tried to get, uh, tried to pressure Jordan to take RT off of the air there. Wow. Like there is, yeah, there's an attempt by the U.S. to not just shield, it's uh, not the U.S., uh, not just the U.S., the Western countries to not just shield their own populations, 
from hearing the other side in this war, but also to impose that information bubble uh, and end blackout onto countries in the global South, which so far hasn't really worked. But, you know, I just think it's really important for people to be diligent in recognizing that we shouldn't lock ourselves in these propaganda bubbles. And even on our side, like, and when I say our side, I just mean like those of us who want to be nuanced about this and see every side, like on the, on a conflict like this, it reminds me a lot of Syria. You want to make sure not to get stuck in just regurgitating every people who are telling you what you want to hear. Mm. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to make that, that note. Cause I think I'm seeing a lot of that happening. Like it, it's kind of that moment. It's been about a month of this war and I'm seeing a lot of lines being drawn where people are like, not even willing to listen to anyone who isn't saying exactly what they want to hear. And of course that is much worse among those who want to escalate and want more, you know, want NATO to intervene, but I'm kind of seeing it across the board. So I, I just hope that we can all like continue to maintain a level of nuance about this conflict because we actually don't know how everything's playing out on the ground and everything is kind of an information war. Yeah, well, certainly we're in the midst of quite the information war. I mean, the sort of 21st century, the things they always were talking about, about how wars in the 21st century would be fought as much in cyberspace as on the ground. I, I mean, I don't know how true that is. Obviously, people fighting and dying is the key factor. But yeah, I mean, the claims, the counterclaims, the, you know, who's saying what, the satellite images, the briefings, all of them are, you know, designed to sort of spin either side, which is, the you know, not that surprising. But I think it does speak to making sure that we have sort of a critical evaluation of everything that's out there yeah. and that people are trying to consume as much as possible. So I'm I'm also thankful to have this platform to be able to do that. And I, I think a lot of times in situations like this, you know, people who claim to know every single element of it and everything that's happening and have the strongest views one side or the other t often tend to turn out not to be right uh, at the end of the day. So yeah, I think that there's, and I think this one for sure, for a range of reasons, it's, you know, it's very tightly controlled information that's coming out, too. So, you know, it's even more difficult than I think in some other conflicts in a lot of ways. But, yeah, when everyone's got a smartphone and who knows who's doing what, it can be tricky. And you can just sort of see the type of news that gets lifted way up and the type of things that you hear corroborated or not corroborated, I'm saying, but that never really get pushed out in right. terms of the context of what's happening. Like if there's shelling in Donetsk and 20 civilians die, you probably won't hear about that. But if Russians launch a missile in somewhere in Ukraine and 20 civilians die, it's going to be the biggest story on, on television. And even if there's sort of a similar level of corroboration about what happened and who was there, you know, it's, you don't see as much. So yeah, it's definitely a good point. I think it's a well-taken point and I'm very glad to have this opportunity to really be able to, to talk more about it and to hear from people who are outside of our yeah. typical bubble. media <laughs> bubble, as it were, um, it, you know, the whole Western <laughs> media bubble, what we hear is just wild. But, um, you know, we want to turn to the continent of Africa and we're going to talk to a few people tonight. We are very honored to be joined here by Ciso Pila. Mkize, who is the national spokesperson for the ANC Youth League, African National Congress Youth League in South Africa. Ciso Pila, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me tonight um, and greetings to your viewers. Well, I know it's afternoon that side. <laughs> no, it's all good. I uh, really appreciate you being with us, even though it's late in the evening. And, you know, Really glad to have you on. Uh, you know, obviously a few weeks back when you all put out your statement when the conflict first started, caught my eye, caught a lot of people's eyes, because you were emphasizing some of the themes that have basically been said to be verboten here in the United States, the role of NATO, the lack of implementation of Minsk II. So I just wonder from your perspective and from the perspective of your organization, you know, what level of of, I guess, blame should we put on, you know, institutions like NATO in setting the stage for this conflict in the first place? Well, um, as countries from uh, Africa, one thing that I need to say is that uh, we, we hate wars because we know what wars have done to our own countries. Uh, but we cannot, and we are happy from where we stand to see President Putin of Russia really standing up to people that have bullied the world for years. Uh, I mean, uh, here in Africa, we've had our losses as well. 
uh, where our our own countries were were invaded, um, led by the Western countries, led by NATO itself. And we did not see or hear anyone say, pray for Libya, for instance. Uh, but then uh, where we are, we see a president who is protecting his people, also protecting everything that is in his country, because there was an agreement that they are not going to move, not even an inch, um, towards the borders of Russia. And they have they are the ones that did not meet uh, what was the agreement. They are the ones that broke the agreement. They are the ones that uh, did not live up to um, the agreements that were there. Now, Putin, all that he is doing is to protect his backyard. I do not think that even even if it's not politics, even 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 if we take it we to take it to our daily lives, uh, there is no father uh, of a house that can allow enemies of his to come closer to his family because those those enemies when they come closer to the family they can do anything. I mean, from where we stand, the people that are to be blamed they could have avoided this um, this war like uh, the president of South Africa have said. This could have been avoided, but they are arrogant, they are self-serving, and they are selfish. And they do not care about the, the many of the lives that are going to be lost. And from where our understanding is that Russia is not had, had no intentions of attacking civilians. But you have a stupid uh, president of a country who uses his own civilians to fight against the Russian troops, when Russian troops are not targeting civilians, but are targeting uh, your military points. Now, that, that I really believe that uh, from where we are here and were brought here by uh, the police, I don't think that they they had thought that um, uh, President Putin is going to have the guts to, to, to man up and to stand up against them. Uh, they did not see this one coming. You can hear from the way they are now uh, pulling off a bit from their support they're trying to give Ukraine, but also uh, you can tell from how they run their proper, their propaganda. Here in South Africa, I can tell you, we are not able to watch R to watch RT anymore. Russian today is not here. We're not able to watch it anymore since this conflict with, between Russia and Ukraine started. Now they are trying to 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 drive the narrative that uh, Russians or President Putin are the worst people to have uh, lived in the world. And we all know the worst people to have lived in the world are the people that have bullied the world, are the people that are very greedy, are the people that have came here in Africa and 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 and, and initiated wars in Africa so that they can get the minerals beneath our soil here in Africa. Those are the people that have got the world on its knees for a very long time. We're very happy that this time around someone at least is standing up to these duelists. Mm -hmm. You know I I have to say, you know, and I think the the point of view that you're you're giving is an, a common one in a, in a lot of the global South. Um, but I think a lot of our viewers in America and Europe are probably like they, they don't hear this point of view really anywhere uh, in their media or from anyone for that matter. Despite the fact that we keep hearing the international community has condemned Russia, Russia, is isolating Russia. Can you give us an idea of how common your point of view is across South Africa from what you can tell? Is this what you're hearing from politicians on a regular basis and from the leadership in the country? And how about people on the street? Look, uh, here in, uh, in, in South Africa, um, our government has been uh, clear on it, as led by our president, Cyril Ramaphosa. He has been clear on the issue. Here in South Africa, you will remember that when uh, we faced apartheid, by the way, when we faced apartheid during our time of apartheid, uh, Russia is one of the countries that were able to, to take us, were able to even give training uh, to our comrades who are fighting for freedom in South Africa. So from where we stand and uh, from what we are seeing and hearing in South Africa, be it on social media, be it on um, national media, your television, your radio news, what we're hearing is one voice. And one voice is that this could have been avoided, but the bullies went on. Now uh, they are the ones, in fact, that can be able to solve the problem. I mean, the only thing is that Ukraine must just say that it's not going to join NATO and we're good, we're fine. because. They have been to, by the way, uh, we have been we have been reading. It's just that now that 
uh, Putin finally decided to go to Ukraine. It's only now that a lot of people speak about it. But for the past eight years, people have been dying in Ukraine. And uh, no one has been caring what is happening in Ukraine. So here in South Africa, and I, I think I must mention also that uh, a week ago, we had a meeting with other uh, progressive youth formations across Africa. And uh, we are agreeing on one thing. And that one thing is that uh, this that avoided we are here today because of um, how the West continues to try and bully uh, the world, and um, it's just unfortunate that Ukraine in this particular war was really used by people that didn't even care about the people of Ukraine, they don't even care about the independence because that is what they say. They say they're doing this for the independence of Ukraine, and that, that is, they do not care about Ukraine, and you can tell from how they they are now speaking in tongues that relates to this war because they can either not pulling back. No, I, I think those are all very interesting points and, and, and I think something that I'm, I'm glad the opportunity to have you speak on it here. And, and one other aspect that is, I think has sort of entered the media but is important By is this issue audible. of the... the of, what am I saying? The students the, the, that were trapped in you Ukraine, African students we can hear you can you hear us hello did you did you lose me no we still no, have no, we can you, hear you can you hear us oh we might have lost you oh no Oof. yeah well, i was sneaking up a little bit there but we'll see yeah. what's happening but yeah i think you know very very important i think to hear uh you know what caesar was bringing us i mean obviously you know, this is a African National Congress Youth League. I mean, this is the youth wing mm -hmm. of the ruling party of South Africa, um, and you know very strongly, uh, you know, laying the blame at the feet of you know the of, of NATO, and I think making the point very clearly that this could have been prevented. And it's just so and, obvious yeah. now when you hear all of these politicians talk about what the potential, uh, you know solution could be what the negotiating could be macron talking about we need collective security boris johnson saying uh they're never going to join nato and so well, why didn't they do this beforehand i mean you right. know why didn't some of these people issue a memo and say oh well we'll veto <laughs> ukraine and nato you know i mean it's something like that anything and it just was wild to me that either this, you know i think it's this. it's well, i think it's uh, the answer to that by the way i think is one of two things either mm. they didn't expect russia to do anything about it like why why do anything if Russia's not going to do anything about it? Like we're the we're the strong power here. Either that or they wanted a war. Like why that's I can't I can't understand why else you wouldn't just say it. Yeah. No, it's a good point. I think you might be right. Oh, you know, and if not want a war, we're willing to risk a war for right. whatever their secondary goals may have been to increase militarism, to you know, promote NATO. But yeah, it does seem very warlike. And of course Biden is there now. Um there's the NATO the G7 and the EU all meeting in one week, I think. So that'll be interesting. But uh, of course, you know, Biden's whole message is we need more sanctions, more sanctions, more weapons, more militarism, mm -hmm. no real conversation in the lead up of how to find peace. And as much as, you know, the, I guess they, everyone is saying they want the war to stop. I mean, it really does seem, certainly from the United States point of view, it's a little less of this in Europe, that everything is very much focused on escalation, very much focused oh, yeah. on sanctions, um, and no real, uh, you know, thought process, no real thought process. Right. In terms fighting, of fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian, as they say. It, does, it really does feel that way. I, and I also saw something of graph. I wish I could remember the exact numbers, but it was comparing the number of companies that had been sanctioned by, like, the various countries, EU, United States, Canada, whatever, whatever. And I, I think I'm saying this right. It was The EU had, I think, had 400-some-odd companies, Russian companies they had sanctioned. America, it was, like, 117. So it's like the U.S. is pushing Europe to tank its own economy while protecting itself, quite frankly. Right. Oh, we have uh, CISO back with us. Um, let's see if, perfect. Can you hear us? Um, yeah, I can hear you. I just hope that you can hear me. We can definitely yes. hear you, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. okay, okay. So, so, so I was just giving a response on what is the word on the streets in South Africa and what is the view 
of uh, the general people of South Africa and Africa. And I was saying that uh, the views that have been presented by our president, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, is actually the views of uh, the citizens of South Africa because we have been friends with Russia for a very long time during our bad times, uh, during our struggle days as the country where we were oppressed um, and uh, the people that we could uh, uh, run to for help, uh, for training of our comrades who were fighting against apartheid, it has to be Russia that came in our rescue and was able to, to assist and train comrades. Uh, but Russia has also been able to assist in many ways. Uh, it fought side by side uh, with us to gain our freedom. So people recognize Russia as a, a country that and Russians, those people that um, are not uh, warmongers, people that are not looking to spill blood for the sake of it, but uh, if it is necessary for Russia to protect its territory, to protect itself, its people, its wealth, um, then uh, President Putin uh, was pushed to do what he is currently uh, doing. Well, and let me just ask you this one quick thing here. Uh, the issue of the African students being trapped in Ukraine, the double standards that we've seen in terms of immigration. I, I mean, I'm just curious your thoughts on that because it just seemed like the exact opposite of what we see from Europe uh, when the issue of immigration from Africa is brought up in any other context. Look, uh, one thing that uh, we have also realized and, and one thing that has been brought to our attention is the racism in which uh, uh, the students and uh, general black people are from South Africa were trapped in uh, in Ukraine, how they've been treated. I mean, uh, other other civilians uh, who are from Ukraine uh, by origin um, are, give, are given preference as it relates to them getting a, a safer place, safer places during this war. Um, generally, there are racial preferences on who gets safe first and uh, who is a last um, last option to to be taken to safer places we've we've seen that happening uh, but also uh, we have seen how um, because our we have student organizations in south africa student organizations that uh, have been in communication with those that are trapped uh, in, uh, in in ukraine and what we're, what we're still uh, trying to make sure that uh, they are brought back uh, safe uh, to the country. But uh, part of the biggest obstacles has really been this uh, racism thing. We, uh, we, can't, we can't even get to our own people ourselves uh, because they are not uh, the priority of the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Well, Ciso Pila, really appreciate you being willing to join us, especially since I know it's a little late on your end. Fantastic to be able to get your voice on this and that of the ANC Youth League. Thanks again for giving us some time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you very much for having me and have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Rania, we want to keep moving around the, the continent here. I mean, I think it's important for people to be able to hear from the African continent, which is, you know, not really being talked about at all in the context of the of this broader conflict, but is obviously one of the continents most affected by the sort of subsidiary realities of the sanctions. So now we want to turn to Ghana, and we are very, very honored to be joined here by Kwesi Pratt Jr., who is the General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana. Mr. Pratt, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. Well, the pleasure is all ours. And, you know, I, we've been talking here about sort of the view from Africa on the crisis in Ukraine uh, and how, you know, there's a lot of voices we aren't hearing in the Western media. So I'm curious from your perspective, looking at this conflict, what is the, everything in the United States is blame Russia, blame Russia, hate Russia, hate Russia, and you're not allowed to say anything about NATO or about the West. But where are you putting more of the, I guess, blame, if you will, in this conflict and for, for why it, it took place? Well, I think, first of all, nobody can glorify war. War is a terrible thing. And if it is possible to avoid war, all of us should work to avoid war anywhere in the world. Terrible consequences, especially for the underprivileged all over the world. And, and the avoidance of war is it's, it's important. Having said that, however, I think that the efforts that are being made by NATO 
and especially by the United States of America, are not aimed at ending the war. They are not aimed at bringing relief to the people of Ukraine. They are just aimed on petrol, on, on, on pouring petrol onto fire, on, on instigating war, on, on, on leading the Ukrainians into believing that they are some kind of superheroes and so on, and they are dying, and, and nobody is coming to their aid. In fact, they cannot come to their aid. I think that this is, this is, this is really atrocious. This urging the Ukrainians on to do things that they cannot defend, to sacrifice their lives for absolutely nothing, you know, I, I, I think is, is most reprehensible. The other thing that I think is absolutely important is the general hypocrisy around the world. And there's so much about the sovereignty of Ukraine, the sovereignty of Ukraine and the sovereignty of Ukraine. Who talks about the sovereignty of the Cuban people? The Cubans were sovereign. The Cuban state was a sovereign state. And yet, when the Cubans invited the Soviet Union to place missiles on, on, on the island, the US protested vehemently. And the US actually threatened to sink the island of Cuba and so on. That matter was very quickly resolved as a result of the maturity of the Communist Party of Cuba and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But who then spoke about sovereignty? Who then spoke about sovereignty when the United States was threatening to sink the island of Cuba? We are talking about uh, 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 the, the killing of civilians and so on. Compare what is happening to what happened in Iraq. The millions of Iraqis who lost their lives as a result of, of the invasion of the United States of America on the basis of a false pretext, the US and its allies claimed that they were invading Iraq because Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Up to today, nobody has found any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It was a lie, a lie told by the US and its allies, and which has led to the slaughtering of more than a million Iraqis. The slaughtering of more than a million Iraqis. Who is talking about the sovereignty of the Iraqi people? Who is talking about the death of the Iraqi people at all? Are, are, are Ukrainian lives more important than the lives of the Iraqi people? Look at the current situation in Palestine. Look at the current situation in Palestine. Look, look, look at the imprisonment of virtually everybody who lives in the Gaza Strip. They live in virtual prisons. You understand? Their lands are being confiscated on a daily basis. Young persons are being killed on a daily basis. Agricultural land is being destroyed on a daily basis. Hospitals are being attacked on a daily basis. Schools are being smashed to the ground on a daily basis. Who is protesting about, about the apartheid regime, the, the Israeli apartheid regime, and the atrocities it is committing in Palestine with the help of NATO countries? with the help of the United States of America, with the help of the, or, 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 of the United Kingdom and so on. Who is complaining? After 20 years of war in Afghanistan, look at what the forces of imperialism have done to the people of Afghanistan. Who is complaining? Check the double standards and so on. And then we are told that this is all in defense of some democracy and freedom. My goodness. 2014, the Ukrainian authorities were burning political parties. They were closing down television and radio stations that they did not agree with. Is this the kind of freedom that we are defending? I just wonder. Now, in all of this, the real victims are the working people in the capitalist states. They are the people who are paying the price for all the imposition of all of these reckless sanctions. Why? Biden and his cabinet, uh, what do they stand to lose? It is the people of the United States of America who are paying for high gasoline prices. It is the people of the United Kingdom who may not be able to heat their homes when gas stops flowing from, 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 from Russia and so on. The empty shops in the Western capitals, 
you know, the collapse of, of, of the transport system and so on. Those who are really going to bear the brunt are the working people of these countries and not the elites of these countries, not the oligarchs that you find in Washington and London and so on. You understand? Now, it is clear also that, that the intention is, is to harm Russia and is to harm Russia and to send a signal to the people of Russia and elsewhere that the NATO countries are not ready to allow independent thinking in international relations. But all of this has failed. It has clearly failed, you know, because Russia appears to be standing on its feet. It appears to be demanding, making the demands that it has been making for eight years, which were ignored. Look, even, even Emmanuel Macron of France admits that the Russians have legitimate security concerns. What are these legitimate security concerns? It is the eastward expansion of NATO. I mean, to the extent that before the war began, the center of Moscow could actually be hit within five minutes from Ukrainian territory. Which country is going to allow that? No country is going to allow that. Now we also have the issue of, of, of the production of biological and, and, and chemical weapons in laboratories in Ukraine. Who is going to allow that? Who is going to allow that? I am sick, really sick, of the hypocrisy of the so-called West. I am really sick of this level of hypocrisy. Is this a uh, sentiment you're expressing, is it common across Ghana, would you say? And also, you know, when you look across the African continent, Africa has not joined the US and EU in sanctions against Russia. Can you explain from your point of view why that is? Well, some African countries have actually joined NATO and, and the US. I mean, in Ghana, the government has act, actually voted with the US in the, in the Security Council, you understand? But these are puppet regimes. These are new colonial regimes. These are regimes that are not interested in breaking out of the, of the yoke of exploitation, you understand? Look, let's, let's go back into history. The Russians did not capture our forefathers as beasts of burden. They did not participate in the transatlantic slave trade. They were not involved in the classical colonial exploitation of our people, the seizure of our lands and resources, they did not. In fact, today, they are not involved in the new colonial scramble for our resources. If anything, it is the Russians and others, mainly from the socialist countries and so on, who rallied to the support of the national liberation movement across Africa and the world, who helped us to struggle to regain our independence and to begin to take the tentative steps towards the control of our own resources and to exploit these resources for the benefit of our people. The Russians are not our enemies. They've never been our enemies. And there's no reason why we should stand against the Russians. And if you look even at the Western media, if you look at Al Jazeera, if you look at uh, the Voice of America, if you listen to the British Broadcasting Corporation, there are harrowing stories of racism even in this war period, African stories are telling stories of them being prevented from joining buses and trains to safety. In one instance, a Nigerian student told the story of how she had to work for 12 hours because of the color of her skin. She would not be allowed to join a train to go to Poland for safety. And that's as if the bombs discriminate against people on the basis of the color of their skin. I'm an African, and I'm never going to accept, I'm never going to accept any suggestion that on the basis of the color of my skin, I'm inferior to any other person anywhere in the world. I would never accept that Africans 
or any other people are inferior just because the color of their skin is different. And this should inform our thinking on the continent. This should inform our thinking everywhere. We are not inferior. Ukrainians may be hankering for democracy, they may be hankering for human rights and so on. It doesn't give them the right to discriminate against us. And if they discriminate against us on the basis of our color, we cannot be showing solidarity to racist oppressors, people who have no respect for the African people. I mean, I think that point is is very well taken. And I, I appreciate the point that you were raising there about Russia's role in Africa, because that's become a big talking point. People saying in Mali and Central African Republic, uh, Russia is acting imperialistically. Uh, how do you feel about that charge? Well, I don't know how they come to the conclusion that Russia is acting imperialistically. Today, I want anybody to give me one good reason why NATO should continue to exist. We were told when we were growing up that NATO existed hmm, as, 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 a, as a structure huh, to fight against communism. Hmm. Today, as we speak, is Russia a communist state? Russia is certainly not a communist state. As we speak, Putin is pursuing a nationalist agenda. You understand? Putin is pursuing a nationalist agenda. With the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and with the dismantling of the Warsaw Pact Treaty nations and so on, what is the justification for the continued existence of NATO today in the world? Absolutely no justification whatsoever. Now, I'm deeply worried about the future of, 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 of the universe. We have been told that the nuclear arsenals we have in the world today, if we were to slip into a thermonuclear war, uh, we have developed the capacity to, de to destroy the world 10 times over. One distraction is sufficient. Just one distraction is sufficient. Isn't it madness to destroy 10 times over when one, one destruction is sufficient? So we should be thinking, what, where is all this leading us? Are we ready for a thermonuclear war? What will be the consequence of a thermonuclear war for everybody? I may not exist anymore. You understand? My children will not exist. My grandchildren will not have the chance of manifesting in this world. Everything is going to get destroyed. To what end? For what purpose? I think it's time for the peace movement to speak out loud and clear that we are fed up with war, we don't want war, and we want to remove all the conditions which promote war. And the number one condition which promotes war is inequality. The number one condition which promotes war is exploitation. The number one condition which promotes war is the imperialist, imperialist bullying attitude. They will have everything for themselves. They will decide for everybody. I mean, what business has the United States of America got deciding whether or not the Nord Stream 2 project succeeds or it doesn't succeed? What is their business? What business has the United States got who buys oil from Russia and who doesn't buy oil from Russia? Is that the business of the United States of America? Certainly not. Let's do the things that promote equity. Let's do the things that promote equality. Let's do the things that banish exploitation in all its forms so that we can have a peaceful, united world of working people working to promote their own interests, working in order to uplift their living and working standards. That should be our goal. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Kwesi Pratt Jr., General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana, really appreciate you giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Real quick, Rania, before we move on, just want to throw in Serge. Thank you for your donation there, yes. making a very notable point. He's, he is Russian, saying that many of his Russian friends feel ashamed 
to be Russian, saying they should listen to our first two guests to find something to be proud of. Very good point. And uh, Martin Hernandez also threw in something a little bit back, <laughs> connecting Madeleine Albright to Bill Clinton. Obviously, he was giving the orders that she was carrying out. We appreciate you every week, Martin. Always there for us in the Super Chat. Really appreciate you. And thanks again, Serge. Seeing you a couple weeks in a row here now. But... Yeah, no, I think important, very important conversations, very important viewpoints oh, absolutely. from the nation of Africa. And we can circle back around maybe towards the end of the show, Rania, and maybe wrap up some of this and think a little bit about this. But I want to move forward. We're very honored to have another guest. It's many, many hours ahead, so I don't want to leave her waiting. Very honored to have back with us Savim Dadelin, who is a Minister of Parliament in the Bundestag for Die Linke, the left in Germany there, and is a spokeswoman for international politics and disarmament. Savim, thank you so much for being back with us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. And very happy to invite you. Uh, in your country, Germany, a lot of discussion there now about the growth of the military, 100 billion euros. They're going to buy the F-35 now, allegedly. Um, looking at this buildup, you know, some are saying that this is peace through strength, that this is good, that you need a big military and, you know, to deter Russia. Uh, do you think that mil this expansion of the military there and militarism in Germany is moving us in a, in a good direction or a bad direction? Well, uh, let us um, look to the facts. The German government now, after the invasion of uh, Russia in Ukraine, decided to spend 100 billion euro extra for military and rearmament. And these are the largest, the largest expenditures since the end of World War II in Germany. Besides, annual spending is supposed to be well above NATO's 2% target. And this would make Germany's military the top spending military in Europe, even way larger than Russia's. And NATO countries are already spending 18 times the military budget of Russia. And neither has this been able to prevent the war, nor will another rise in military spending stop the war. Russia's invasion and the reaction of the West threatened to drag us back into an old world of arms races and forced deployments of proxy wars and economic conflicts. And on the other side, does this mean that rising armament expenditures will lead to further social cuts and um, a further uh, impoverishment of large parts of the people? I mean, like we heard now from, uh, from Africa, from uh, Ghana, while our societies become more and more socially divided in, Ger uh, in, in Germany or in Europe, and whole population groups are socially excluded, the military industrial complex is the main beneficiary of this development. And since the invasion, stock prices of defense constructors Contractors in, in, in Germany are at the record high and, and a revived Cold War will ravage uh, domestic budgets in Europe and in the US and wasting, really wasting hundreds of billions on weapons is distracting us from real security threats such as climate costs, catastrophes and uh, will bind resources needed to address inequality. And this is uh, the main challenge we have, climate crisis, inequality, hunger crisis, for example, and, uh, we, uh, and uh, we shouldn't waste so much uh, money for, for military. You know, I'm, I'm curious about uh, what this war, the massive wave of refugees that it's bringing across Europe, what, what do you think it'll mean for the EU and its unity. And on top of that, do Germans want Ukraine to join the EU? We hear increasing talk about uh, the possibility of Ukraine joining the EU. I think, you know, uh, since it was 2008, it was a really big mistake by uh, Bush, the US president in uh, Bucharest at the NATO summit to give Ukraine the illusion and the hope 
to get Ukraine as a member of the NATO. There was no need to to do this, and it was totally uh, surreal. It was not real. It was not a real option at uh, at all, a serious option. That was a big mistake. And now we are going to have the second big mistake, and this is mm. to give Ukraine uh, the illusion it could be a member of the European Union. You know, the European Union and the NATO, they do have um, a common point. That is no membership to countries who have territorial problems, domestic problems. We do have one member state of the European Union who do have has a serious problem. This is Cyprus, for example, because of the uh, military invasion in the north of Cyprus by the Turks uh, since uh, middle of uh, 70s. And that's a really serious problem and we can't get rid of it. And uh, and that's a, that's a big danger to have another such uh, problem in the European Union. And uh, I think the best would be to have neutrality for Ukraine and security guarantees for both sides. That would be a better reason, a better better solution uh, for all the uh, players at the moment in Europe. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry, Eugene. No, 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 go ahead, Rana. Well, I was just also wondering, you know, on top of that, because obviously Germany before February 24th was being condemned by the Americans and the British hawks for its reluctance to support war. And then after the invasion, it performed a bit of an about face. And now it's supporting these punishing sanctions on Russia. It's increasing its military budget. There does seem to be a lot of unity among the Western countries about escalating the war. So I'm curious, are there any voices in Germany um, that are trying to de-escalate this war? Well, there are some voices, but the problem is uh, at the moment, of course, because of this war, and it started uh, by by the Russians, uh, because of this war, all the followers, all the fans of uh, of the policy of the detente, uh, policy of detente by, um, you know, started by the former Chancellor Willy Brandt and his assistant Egon Bar, um, having dialogue with Russia for a common security architecture in Europe. Uh, they are now very calm, very silent, uh, very threatened uh, as well by all the military uh, military Atlantists. That's the, really a serious problem, you know, and um, that's uh, that's a problem uh, we are now facing. Uh, and uh, I think it's it will take a while. Uh, it will take a while uh, when these voices are coming up as well uh, again. Um, after and I think uh, they can at latest when this uh, when the uh, when the war stops when we have a ceasefire, when we have negotiations. And uh, and I really want to underline this. We do have a lot of aggressive voices at the moment, aggressive voices in the US, aggressive voices in, uh, in Germany and uh, in Europe um, who are now um, calling for more sanctions, calling for a no-fly zone, calling for more arm deliveries uh, to Ukraine. Uh, but it's uh, it's uh, all um, it's all very dangerous. I think we must be very clear. This proposal, like a no-fly zone, would be a sui- uh, suicidal um, proposal. A no-fly zone will lead us uh, to a World War Three. And besides expanding stationing of NATO troops, for example, uh, on the Russian border in the Slovakia, in Romania and uh, Lithuania, uh, does not help the people of Ukraine at all, but increases the risk of an expansion of the war in, in order to avert the risk of an unthinkable direct conflict between the world's two largest nuclear powers. Uh, that is needed. What is needed now is not increased military funding, but a return to intense negotiations. We need more voices for negotiations. Even before the invasion, the left in Germany has consistently, and very lot of people, the majority in Germany uh, actually, called for a diplomatic solution um, 
to the crisis in Ukraine res that respects the international law and international borders, even though it may uh, be unpopular to point it out, the expansion of NATO uh, to Russia's borders provided the context uh, of this crisis, of course. And, and, and that's, that's a problem. As long as this war is going on, the problem is that a lot of voices who are for dialogue, for peace, for a common security architecture in Europe, they are calm. I mean, still we do have, of course, but the thing is uh, the, the atmosphere is uh, warmongering uh, like it is uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's an important point. And I, and I think the point you raise about negotiations and voices for peace is key because, uh, you know, we're basically being told that at least in the United States, that the only solution now is essentially a new Cold War. That even if the conflict stops tomorrow, that at this point it's too late, there's nothing that can be done, people in Europe can never live together, we're going to go back to what we did, you know, for 60 years. I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you disagree with that, but I wonder how you respond to that, because that's what most Americans are hearing, is that even if the war ends tomorrow, we're in a new Cold War, there are no solutions and there's no diplomacy that can help. No, I mean, what's the alternative to diplomacy? The alternative is war. The alternative is a world war three, and no one will win, and no one will survive. That's insane. That's really insane. Whoever is going to propose such a thing is insane in, uh, from my point of view. We have to insist in diplomacy. Neither sanctions nor armed supplies will end the war in Ukraine. The only way to do so is to seek a diplomatic solution by negotiation. Like the US intervention in Iraq in 2003, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is against the international law. But however, Western politics need to understand supplying more arms to Ukraine will only lead to an escalation of Russian's invasion and will be paid not by the US, not by the German, but will be paid by Ukrainians with their lives and the destruction of their country. Russia, Russia's military is by far superior and Ukraine will not be able to win this war. And all those who cry or beg for a NATO intervention, they shouldn't forget Russia is a nuclear superpower like the US. Actually, it's, it's more. It's more because it has uh, more than 6,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, rockets and Russia is not Yugoslavia, which was bombed in 1999. The NATO war started on March 24th, 23 years before today. And Russia is not Iraq. The US aggression started in March 20, 20th in 2003. Russia isn't a small country like these two uh, weak, uh, uh, weak uh, uh, with a with a weak ar uh, army like uh, Iraq and uh, Yugoslavia. Therefore, the armed supplies to Ukraine uh, by NATO will extend military fighting, lead to an intensification of Russian artillery and air attacks, and cost even more lives. Instead, we need to urge both parties to agree to an immediate ceasefire and seek a diplomatic solution. The ceasefire could be followed by a compromise settlement, including uh, Ukraine's neutrality and the security guarantee for both sides. And, uh, but the thing is, you know, as we have the war and these warmongers everywhere on the both sides of the Atlantic, few words fit these times better than the dictum of the French philosopher and socialist Jean Jaurès, Jean Jaurès uh, over 100 years ago. Jean Jaurès said, capitalism carries war within it, within it like the cold, uh, the cloud, sorry. <laughs> capitalism carries war within it like the cloud carries the rain. Mm. And in order to prevent further damage, we need an intensive, really intensive debate and cooperation of progressive forces on both sides of the Atlantic who do not want to be taken over by war politics and oligarch capitalism on the both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. 
Well, really appreciate that and really appreciate your voice. We are, we're following your tweets at the very least here in the United States. It's good to have strong voices for peace there. And thank you and all of your colleagues in Delinka for, you know, being willing to come and help, uh, help us understand all these thorny issues. Savine Dadelin, a member of parliament there in Germany representing the left, Delinka, thank you so much for your time. Thank you uh, for having me and take care. Mm -hmm. Well, Rania, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's it's just funny because when we had Savim on just prior to the war, everything that she was saying about how the war could be averted is now what people are right. saying is the way the war could be ended. And you're just thinking, well, why didn't anyone do anything? You know, it's right. just, it's, she was warning, we're totally in a dangerous place, things could happen. But, you know, if you don't reverse course, something bad is going to happen and here we are but there is a possibility and i think there is you know a level of hope there in terms of 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 the possibilities i know it's hard to say that in the midst of a great conflict but there does seem to at least be a path out even if it's a, a difficult windy rocky one so really appreciate uh really appreciate that sorry i was just checking my time there uh <laughs> lost track of where we were no um, it's yeah, all really good no you're absolutely that. right yeah and yeah no go ahead i was just gonna say you're absolutely right this was totally preventable didn't have to happen there's a way out like it's like the worst is still preventable its continuation is still preventable it's just a matter of getting countries like the u.s on board with ending this conflict because right now what's standing in the way of ending this conflict is pouring more weapons into ukraine uh, and, you know, making it impossible for negotiations to take place. Yeah. Well, we want to swing to a different topic, although not totally unrelated. We had uh, Mr. Crazy Pratt with us from Ghana who mentioned the global slave trade and the impact on Africa. That's an issue that is making news in the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica, as Will and Kate have traveled there for the Queen's Platinum <laughs> Jubilee, I believe. Uh, and a number of Jamaicans are making their voices heard on a number of these crucial issues. And we are very happy to be joined by Dr. Maziki Thame, who is a senior lecturer in the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. Dr. Thame, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for having me. No, it's our honor to have you here. And I think most Americans have probably just seen that, you know, Will and Kate went to Jamaica, that some Jamaicans seemed upset about it. And that's kind of the extent of what we're hearing in the U.S. So if you could give us sort of a capsule view um, of, of, of what's happened, of, of the trip they brought and, and why individuals have been standing up against it. So this is the 60th year of independence for Jamaica. And this is the 70th year that the queen is on the throne. And I am not sure why, but William and Kate are doing a kind of tour of the Caribbean. They were in Belize, there, there were demonstrations there, and you know they had to divert from a part of their tour. And then they came to Jamaica and um, some Jamaicans, not all, um, felt that this was an opportune time to, to stand for a claim that has been made for some time now. It's not new that the Brits owe reparations to descendants of enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. And that, um, you know, as the Brits are thinking about their own future, as we are thinking about ours, that it is a time as it is always a time to talk about reparations for the descendants of people enslaved in the Caribbean and that worked to make Europe rich, essentially. So um, I um, was a part of the Advocates Network, which is a loose grouping um, of people, some of whom are connected to organizations, some of whom are not. Um, and we come together around issues that we think are important nationally. In this case, it touches on our colonial past. Well, we could argue that most issues that occur touch on our colonial past. Um, so that we wrote a letter, an open letter to Will and Kate saying that we demand an apology, we demand reparations, and that we would stand in protest 
on Tuesday, just passed, um, on the day that they arrived, they actually came after the protests. Um, and that's what was done. But it's a contradictory moment because at the same time that there were those of us standing across from the British High Commission, um, when the royals did arrive, you had um, you know people in their communities coming out to see the royals and to celebrate them in ways that indicate for those of us who are minded towards decolonization that there's still a lot of work to do to um, you know educate ourselves out of the the ways that Europeans imagined us in the period of slavery and colonialism. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know oh, sorry, for, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just going to say for a lot of Americans and I think Europeans and they think of Jamaica as a place that they go vacation in, right? That's how they see it as the place you go, you know, when you have time off work, uh, you take your family to, to a resort. So can you just briefly explain what the what what has been done to Jamaica uh, by the British to elicit these protests? I mean, aside from enslavement, which is obviously something the British and many other European powers did across North America. Well, it's, it's rooted in enslavement, obviously, but, um, you know, this is the enslavement of Africans is a part of the um, growth of global capitalism. And when you point to the tourism product as one of the ways in which, you know, Americans know a place like Jamaica, for some of us, the tourism product is the, the plantation in the present. You know, it operates on low wage labor. Um, essentially, Africans are, you know, selling their labor, selling sex, um, and making the resources of the, the nation available um, to tourists, particularly white tourists. Um, and here, many people can't even access the, these resources that are supposed to be national. So there's a way that the, the, the island is constructed out of British colonialism and that the, the, the legacy of that remains with us in terms of how ordinary people live their lives. And if you come to Jamaica, you know, as a tourist and quote unquote, feel all right, according to uh, the, the, the message to tourists, you really don't see what life is like for many Jamaicans, which which includes um, you know tremendous amounts of you know struggling. Um, Jamaicans consider themselves to be sufferers because that is what their lives have looked like, and that has to do with the fact that coming out of slavery, they did not own the land. They were never compensated in the period of colonialism. After 1838, they continued to face problems of access, you know, they were not in the, the, the structure of government. When they did try, as in 1865, which was the Morant Bay War, where, um, you know, you had a movement to purchase lands to allow for ordinary Black Jamaicans to go into the legislature. Um, it was brutally put down by the colonials. The representative model was changed thereafter, Crown Colony government imposed, so that there would be no possibility that these descendants of Africans could come to power until 1962. And by this time, there is a period of decolonization around the world, and empire is beginning to take on new form. But the legacy of poverty remains with us. And that is, you know, defining of just how ordinary people live their lives. You know, one thing I'm curious about, and I, whenever I see these royal tours, I'm always just, you'd think they would have some sense of how it looks, but nevertheless, uh, is there any, maybe I'm being too conspiratorial here, but do you feel any connection between uh, the Duke and Duchess coming to Jamaica now, very shortly after Barbados, uh, became a republic, and the conversation, I think, in the Caribbean in general, as you've noted, around reparations and other things like that, um, has been moving forward apace. Does it feel like this might be some level of attempt by the British to, to try to corral any increased movement in the Caribbean in terms of sovereignty and, and, and independence? It is possible. Um, you know, the British pay a lot of homage to the Commonwealth 
and to the idea that the Commonwealth is part of their legacy. And this has nothing to do with what we get out of it, but certainly I think in Europe, there remains some attachment to the notions, the imperial notions of, um, you know, the, the former grandiosity of the colonial period. So it may very well be that um, they saw the Barbados move as, you know, indicative of what may happen elsewhere in the Caribbean because the Barbados move did push um, discourse in Jamaica. Though Barbados is not the first, Guyana already moved um, away from um, the crown, so did Trinidad and Tobago, and um, not as specific to the British, but Haiti would have been the first example of a republic in the Caribbean. Um, and we know that they came to freedom through um, a revolutionary process. So it may very well be that this is how they are imagining themselves and, you know, the need to, to um, you know, reassert their importance in the region. Um, it may also be related to William's own, um, you know, location um, in in taking over the the crown soon enough. Well, possibly. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what what informs it from that end, but but certainly, what is happening in the region may may inspire some nationalism on their part. Well, what do you make of these sort of like half-hearted, if you can, can even call them that, apologies, um, these statements apologizing for slavery? Um, extreme does sorrow. Does that mean it? Yeah, extre is that, yeah, is that even an apology? Extreme sorrow right. for abhorrent slavery. What does that mean? Yeah. Does it mean anything? We, we don't see them as apologies. Um, you know, there's a distancing that happens when you say um, this should never have happened. The fact is it did. And the fact is you are a beneficiary of it. Not only was the UK a beneficiary of it, but the Windsors as a family mm. benefited from slavery. And, you know, the, the hierarchy, the British hierarchy of governance has um, many individuals who are in power now that can trace their wealth to the plantation in the Caribbean. So that, um, you know, the idea that you can express, oh, sorrow for um, what occurred and say that, um, you know, we respect the courage of Jamaicans and, you know, you're basically saying to us, go ahead, continue on the path of resilience, but we don't take responsibility for how you have experienced the world or otherwise your location um, in global capitalism, we can see that some, you know, moral indiscretion may have occurred in the past, but that's maybe not who we are presently. And for me personally, you know, the statement was, was very angering because the contradictions of the relationship with Britain and Jamaica, you know, um, in recent times, they have been deporting people who had were descendants of the Windrush generation, people who had gone to the UK in search of work and faced racism when they when when they went. Um, we have to get a visa to go to the UK, um, but you are telling us in your statement that the Queen is not only your grandmother, but she is a grandmother to many. For us, grandmothers know their kid and kin, and we know that we are not a part of that community. So that there is a certain, you know, disrespect that is undergirding the message because there is a failure to take responsibility. It's not a real, it's, it's not in any way a, an apology in my mind. Well, Dr. Thame, we really appreciate you being willing to join us and help us sort through all of this and, and enlighten our listeners as to this. And we really appreciate you giving us some of your time on the freedom side. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Yeah, it really is wild uh, to see. I mean, they, I don't know. I have, again, I always say I'm so shocked that they think that this somehow looks good, you know, to be doing these tours with these pasty white royals. 
and the you know former subjects in the colonies. But either way, it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Uh, CBS News did report that the Queen ordered this tour because she was unsettled by what happened in Barbados. Um, uh, that's what they're reporting. Who knows what the real truth is? But it does show how deeply attached. I thought Dr. Thay made a good point. How deeply attached they still continue to be to this colonial legacy, you know, through the Commonwealth, oh, yeah. the La Francophonie, all these different little elements that are designed to keep that imperial metropole feel going. Yeah, I mean, even their, uh, even the way they dealt with, they, they can't even get on board the British royal family, can't even get on board with like the basic identity politics of neoliberalism that many other leaderships across the West have been able to get on board with. Yeah, you Bill see, Clinton apologized I'm just, I'm talking like 30 course. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, they can't, they couldn't even deal with the fact that like one of their own married like a half black woman. I mean, right. you know, and they had to like right. flee. So they can't even deal with like that. It's like the, like, it, it requires almost nothing to just be like, okay, we're cool with like this sort of fake way of being anti-racist. They can't even deal with that, let alone actually, you know, actually acknowledging not just a colonial past of slavery, but also, yeah, I mean, you're still benefiting from that wealth. So yeah. it's it's really disgusting to go to to sit there and say you you feel extreme sorrow uh, when you're not doing anything to actually like deal with the ramifications of it and make it better today yeah. you're literally just trying to get off easy um yeah, so yeah. no I, that's couldn't put it any better <laughs> and decent segue talking about racism we're going to turn to the supreme yeah. court hearings right now where we've seen some pretty ridiculous performances by many very happy to be joined <laughs> as we continue the show by anoa changa an atlanta-based journalist activist and host of the podcast the way with anoa anoa Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, the pleasure's all ours. And, you know, I have to say, Noah, this, it was been interesting to, to watch this because, and I'm sure you were seeing this in the lead up, the Republicans were so, like, they were like, we're not going to, we're going to be super nice. Everything's going to be, we're going to be very respectful. Lies. You know, it's all going to be good. We're not going to be like they were against Kavanaugh. And then the first thing out of their mouth and is then. Judge Ketanji Brown is soft on uh, Brown Jackson is soft on child pornography. And I'm just like, well, what happened to this whole civility thing? I mean, it really does seem that their attacks on her have been very barbed, very pointed, very underhanded. Yeah, I mean, they're feeding into some of the worst misinformation, disinformation um, that we've seen, uh, I think, outside of the election being stolen. I mean, it's very clear they're using this right now as an opportunity to talk to their base ahead of the 2022 midterm election cycle. I mean, and to continue to double down, particularly with Senator Hawley, but several others, to double down on aspects of her record, her sentencing record as a federal district court judge that have already been debunked, even by the National Review, right? Like a conservative fellow with the National Review who does not support her confirmation at all already has knocked back um, Holly's assertions. And that is someone who's actually handled, um, I think he litigated as a prosecutor, uh, mm. these types of sex crimes. So it is, there's so much more nuance going on that unfortunately the average American is not going to catch on to. Um, I, you know, even as a former lawyer, like some of this stuff was going, I had to Google some of it myself. <laughs> um, so they are hoping though that they can at least sully her name enough to be able to tie it to Biden and the Democrats going into the election cycle. I don't know if folks caught this on Twitter the other day, aside from the uh, child pornography claims that they keep going on and on about, and she's very clear as she repeats herself constantly about the differences in the, what she considers in sentencing. And we should want judges who are conscientious and thoughtful, right? Because as much as we don't like the, we might not like these types of defendants, there are other defendants in these systems who are most certainly uh, what we might think of as being sympathetic, who may have judges who just like throw the book at, you know, just having simple marijuana possession in those parts of the country where marijuana possession is still a crime. But we also have the GO uh, we actually at work, we actually have had GOP talking points sentence pitched to us as mm. a part of our coverage. And, you know, these are talking points coming directly from, you know, the party itself. So what the senators are doing, whether it's Lindsey Graham losing his absolute mind, right, or it's <laughs> Holly or Cotton or whomever, they are repeating the standard line. This is the mainstream uh, general uh, line from the, 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 the GOP as a way to be able to attack Joe 
Joe Biden and Democrats coming up. And, and there's plenty to complain about with the Democrats about doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see uh, the sort of bringing up Brett or invoking Brett Kavanaugh when as if like, as if some anybody is deserved, like he actually was like a sexual, he sexually assaulted people. Yeah. And it's like invoking that to make it okay to treat someone who's not, who hasn't sexually, as far as we know, sexually assaulted anybody is just completely disgraceful. That's more of a, of a comment than a question. But I guess also just the optics of it. I mean, having a bunch of old white guys, you know, grill this, grill this black woman the way they were was, was also just absurd to watch. Yeah, I mean, between that and then also, like I said, you know, you have the party itself even tweeting out an image of her crossing out her initials KBJ and replacing them with CRT because, you know, that's their other go-to uh, uh, demonization that they have going on and, and literally saying that she is akin to this boogeyman that we claim is going to destroy America because really what it is, what we're seeing, I mean, watching Lindsey Graham, who's supposed to be one of the reasonable old guard, right? Him and Joe Biden mm -hmm. allegedly are really great friends i mean it's ridiculous um watching him lose his mind over brett kavanaugh was wild right he was upset he's like what do you think about what democrats did to him and she's just like i don't have an opinion i'm here to answer your questions though it's really not fair but this is the type of thing that we know that black women that women of color have had to deal with historically in these types of positions whether it's going up for a confirmation process and she's not the first one we've seen have to deal with these types of attacks but is particularly egregious just because of the power and importance that the Supreme Court holds overall, particularly when we're talking about a Republican agenda that is trying to decimate rights um, across the board, across so many different issues. And so, um, so yeah, just, just they don't care about optics, though, because they're also allegedly at the same time trying to bring more diversity into the party. So as long as they have black and brown faces in high places also repeating these things, they can't possibly be racist, right? Um, we unfortunately have Democrats who think that same type of mentality makes people non-racist as well. Um, I think also with, with, with Ted Cruz making book sales, uh, the end of policing and anti-racist baby as well, because he's upset because a progressive private school that she's on the board of, people are intentionally exposing their children to this type of information. That is their choice and they pay $40,000 a year to be able to do that. Um, and apparently even his school where his kids go to have some of these books on, uh, it's a private <laughs> school and they have this, some of those books too. So it's, 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 it's Ted Cruz Ted Cruz's kids are learning CRT, but he doesn't want yours to learn CRT. So, yeah. <laughs> it really does tell you <laughs> quite a bit. I think Lindsey Graham also voted for Judge Brown Jackson for yeah. the for Court of Appeals. So it's like he's raising all this hue and cry. And a year and a half ago, he thought that she was good enough to vote for her. And it does just sort of speak to, you know, another issue you hit on, Anoa, like the importance of the Supreme Court and how... I mean, these things are always kind of a circus, and I think to some degree they always have been, at least in the TV era. But how far away the discussion really is from what we're actually doing with our justice system. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the views the judge was putting out on a range of issues around sentencing and other things. I mean, these are like critical conversations about what our criminal legal system is going to be. But instead, it's just like, can we can we get her in a gotcha moment? And, you know, then for her, then becomes, how do you say, the least amount possible because you don't want to get caught in a gotcha moment. And it's like, I don't know, I guess I shouldn't expect this. But you think, like, shouldn't this be a moment where we're having, like, a real conversation about where we are in the criminal legal system after so much of the past five or six years? And it's just a political show. Well, yeah, and I mean, that's also a part of the problem with the media coverage, a lot of the media coverage around the hearings as well. They're making it seem like, oh, they're angry, they're putting her on the spot. It's not just simply that they're angry and they're putting her on the spot or whatever those clean or there's hypocrisy. I mean, this is an opportunity for us to actually have a real mature adult conversation, right, with these supposed adults in the room about what is the fate of not just the Supreme Court, but like you said, Eugene, the criminal, the criminal legal system as a whole going forward, right? And she's having very real conversations about the sentencing guidelines. I mean, folks are getting a history lesson about how sentencing guidelines, you know, came into being, about how they went from mandatory to discretionary, about how federal court judges and the things that they consider. One thing that I do appreciate that she keeps touching on, even as people are complaining about the sentencing of child pornographers or those who have consumed child pornography, yes, absolutely atrocious, mother of two, auntie, hate it all, 
But at the same time, what she's talking about in terms of unwarranted disparities between um, individuals, I think this actually came up when she was talking about a case involving what Tem Tom Cotton was calling a drug kingpin. I don't even know that anyone uh, outside of the 80s, you know, calls people kingpins anymore, but whatever. But she was talking about unwarranted disparities and how there are people in similarly situated situ uh, 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 sentencing situations who are being sentenced to 10 years less than this individual for the same exact scenario. That is what, you know, judges are supposed to be looking at and she talked about how she objectively approaches this but that's also a part of her training as the few years that she spent as a federal public defender um, I remember just having a conversation interviewing as a public defender um, years ago when my own children were little and being asked about handling sex crimes I was I was fine with doing those defenses personally but as a mother of two young children I was like I can't do anything involving children and so when she's talking about how difficult this is as a judge you don't necessarily get that same uh, ability to not handle certain cases what comes on your docket comes on your docket and so when she's saying these are tough and I had to make tough decisions but I did what was right for the system overall and for fairness and justice that's what's driving her now there are some other things that bother me like the democratic strategy of trying to appease to everyone's sensibilities because see look the police unions love her <laughs> we saw this also with Kristen Clark when she was going up for her nomination um, uh, for the DOJ for as an assistant attorney general for the civil rights division I mean that is their strategy to try and wrap these amazing otherwise amazing black women on their own right in what that, you know, they think sensible white people would, would want to hear. Uh, the cops love her too. So uh, that's not working though. And we see her being left to hang out to dry with the exception of Cory Booker, surprise, surprise, who kind of, as much as he talks about, oh, that's my friend. I actually like this person. I'm like, why do you like them? But it's Cory Booker, uh, you know, going, you know, off yesterday, basically, even got the attention of my 18 year old when he saw it on TikTok. So um, there's a lot happening here. And, and just really, I mean, Democrats, if they have not learned anything with which I'm still understand, can't understand how they haven't learned anything. Republicans are not going to deal in good faith, no matter how much you try to appease to their sensibilities. And the best thing you do is just make the best case possible and just shoot it straight to the American people and, and the electorate as we're looking towards the midterm elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think you... No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I, well, I was, I was just going to ask. I, I was glad you brought up the public defender issue because... That's I, what I was going to ask know, about, too. Okay. Almost every <laughs> judge is like a prosecutor. <laughs> you know, that's like the way yep. you become a judge. So it's super rare at any level that a public defender even gets nominated for something like this. I, you know, to some degree, we see why now. But it, you talk about the importance of that, if you could, to have someone who's been on the other side of the criminal bar uh, in a position like, well, any judge position, but in the Supreme Court, and what that kind of perspective... I mean, you never know what someone's going to do, but at least the potentiality of having that kind of perspective in the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of people don't really, we see the good cases that, you know, or, you know, cases like Janice that really upset everyone, but we see the few good cases like, oh, this is so great, the liberal justices, but folks like, like uh, uh, RBG, you know, actually, I remember reading cases by R that RBG was a part of when I was in law school in criminal procedure, and just seeing that she co-signed really some really regressive attitudes and approaches mm -hmm. to what was acceptable, particularly when we were talking about criminal defendants of color. Um, you know, when we think about stopping first when we think about the jurisprudence around searches and seizures and all those things they're coming from the mindset and being decided by people who are prosecutors who themselves worked alongside police to over incarcerate to over prosecute you know a, a disproportionate number of black and brown people around the country in multiple jurisdictions so having someone who's a public defender you know not just the fact that she was a public defender you know at the state or county level which is super important she was a federal public defender right so she was working in the federal system dealing with some of these issues so she's dealt with drug cases presumably I mean there's been a lot to do about her representing folks at Guantanamo Bay and I mean that is another level of letter uh, level of constitutional uh, analysis and understanding about rights and, and how to protect people from particular deprivations of those rights that has not really uh, uh, been delved into nearly enough particularly when we're talking about folks whether they are you know American born uh, of Middle Eastern descent or otherwise or they're they're they're, they're immigrants here right like like the 
the way in which people's rights have been stripped away and everyone just showing like, well, they're terrorists, so why does it matter? Just even the labeling of people as terrorists in and of itself deserves to be challenged. So the fact that we have had people like Judge Kataji Brown Jackson who worked in that capacity to help folks who are, you know, who were detained at Guantanamo Bay, who have been trapped in these systems and detained indefinitely, right? Like under the mm -hmm. Patriot Act, under the very different proposals uh, uh, passed under during the war on terror, you know, we have had, we've seen, or we haven't seen because it's been shrouded from the public eye, the way in which people have been detained and, and, and kept away. And I know, Rania, in particular, this is something that, that you have talked about a lot in your own work and coverage. And so having that type of background, I mean, basically the way they have tried to drag her for that in particular, um, which again made her have to, like, I love America, my brother's a soldier, all that <laughs> stuff. I hate when we have to do that. Right. But she was right to represent and to do the vigorous representation that she did, how she did. I, I know at least one of her clients ended up being, um, you know, repatriated. I, I, I'm not sure if that's the proper terminology, back to Afghanistan. I mean, but there's so many different egregious examples of people who have been locked into systems and people really need to understand, the American public really needs to understand the way in which folks, whether they're of Muslim faith or they're just of Arabic heritage, have been absolutely railroaded in many instances and have simply maybe gone to the same mosque or had a conversation with someone. And that's something that uh, Maha Halal has talked about in her book, and it's said until proven Muslim. So this is a very real issue, and it's and it's pretty mm -hmm. amazing to have somebody like her headed to the Supreme Court who has the other side of that analysis when we're talking about the constitutionality of what it means to detain people and, and, and when and if people's rights can be deprived. Yeah, totally. I, I think you would, I want someone who fought against torture on uh, the Yeah, thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I know it's a lot to ask. I know it's a lot to ask, but maybe Joe Biden could like call up his friend Lindsey Graham and be like, hey, the woman I nominated, could you back off since we're buddies? That you voted for, <laughs> that you voted for before. That you, I mean, she's right, been confirmed right. by the same body, various iterations of the same body, three times, the U.S. Citizen Commission as a federal district court judge and as a federal, federal appeals judge. So she's already gone through the rigor three different times. She was also rumored to be on Obama's shortlist back in 2016 when they went for what they thought was going to be the safe choice, um, which led to <laughs> the first of at least two stolen seats, um, you know, during the Trump administration. And so here we are now trying to see if it's not going to change the court in terms of the majority and the decisions. But, you know, there is power in this sense. We have seen Sotomayor and often the lone voice of reason. And hopefully now she gets a partner in crime to kind of shift things a little. And who knows, maybe someday the, the, the judicial, I, I forget, it's the judicial, there's an act that um, Hank Johnson and others have introduced in Congress that is what they've been asking her about along with demand justices request, request to expand the court so we might get those four justices maybe someday and maybe the balance of power does shift in the other direction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well it's going to be interesting to see today was the last day of questioning i i maybe final question i mean you know everyone's saying it's a, it's a sure thing you think that's probably the case or are there potential any surprises out there in the vote well i mean you know our good old friend joe manchin <laughs> I mean, he is the wild card. Whether or not Murkowski, whether or not, you know, again, the Republicans, at least, you know, one or two of those Republicans who previously voted for her, I think she had three Republican voters, be votes before uh, last year, whether or not they actually vote the right way. I mean, because all their objections, they have nothing to really object to with her. She has more trial experience than uh, Amy Coney Barrett. I forget the other ones, but it's like three of them combined. She has more trial experience. All of three of them com combined together already on the bench. She has a, she is tied with Justice Roberts for the highest approval rating out of the recent um, justice nominations. That was actually a poll that came on the Hill um, recently. So there isn't really a good reason to vote for her, except for the fact that people want to be racist and they love disinformation <laughs> and they got to feed the base. So, mm -hmm. I mean... If, if Democrats hold the line and if one or two Republicans, you know, are brave and bold, then she's fine. Um, but if Democrats hold the line, then we see Kamala Harris, you know, having to cast that vote. And if Democrats don't hold the line, I mean, I, you know, I think we might see um, the, the aunties, the black aunties who showed up for Kamala, you know, they might show up and they might not like that. So we'll see what happens, <laughs> honestly. Um, I, I don't know. I can go either way, but there isn't a good reason to vote against her.
Mm-hmm. Well, Anoa, really appreciate you giving us some of your time, helping us sort through all these thorny issues. As always, it's an honor to have you here with us on the Freedom Side. Absolutely. Great to be with y'all. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Rania, it really is. I mean, like I said, these things are always, you know, circus-like to some degree ever since they started putting them on yep. TV. But this has just been like, <laughs> it, they're just scraping Everyone's the bottom chancing. of the barrel. They're just making stuff up. <laughs> it's just, I mean, the AP had like a fact check about the whole child pornography thing. And all these cases where Josh Hawley was saying, oh, well, she gave below the sentencing guidelines. The prosecutor had asked for the lower sentence. So it's just, you know, <laughs> the, the whole reality of it just completely falls apart on so many different levels. But yeah, I mean, it's clear what they're trying to do. I think Noah's correct. They're trying to, you know, cut their campaign ads or whatever for the fall, but- Oh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Like here's me, here's me standing up to the mean lady that they're, you know, the mean black justice, like vote for me, all you other racists <laughs> out there. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Don't no, forget, when it comes we are race, racist. This is what you, yeah. just in Don't case forget, you thought, just a reminder, we're still with you. Here's me yelling at a black woman, <laughs> absurdities, and making yeah. things up and smearing her on national television. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, I suppose. It doesn't. Um, but, well, yeah. yeah, we covered a lot today, <laughs> Rania. Yeah. Um, we did. You know, I Supreme think this, Court, this is a Jamaica, fantastic show. Fantastic. Any, any, any major themes, anything you want to bring out? You know, I think it was really interesting to hear from people, um, I mean, from two African countries, obviously not the whole African continent, but just to hear a very different perspective. Like you are not hearing anything even remotely close to that in this very scripted and kind of staged media environment that we're in in the West, Um, which because I consume it all, I feel like I'm there, you know, watching it with you. Um, where really it's like, it's like the, it, it makes you forget there's an entire world out there. The vast majority of it, in fact, that isn't running around like waving Ukrainian flags and repeating the same talking points that you're hearing, like burned into your brain from CNN and MSNBC and the blue check marks, excluding myself, of course, on Twitter. So, um, so that was, I mean, I think a really, I, I, I really, I really love that we got to give a platform to people and we did it last week too, basically speaking to people from the developing world, because like they're a majority of the world and they're not having, you know, they have no voice in this, you know, mainstream press. That's like the international community says this and the international community says that. I mean, it's like, do you, do you mean Europe and America and like Australia and Canada and (laughs) Japan? That's yeah. not that they many don't even countries and not that many people. Really. It's yeah. just Australia. <laughs> just, I think it's because yeah, New Zealand has true. a lot of trade with China. So they just, they're they out. They're oh, out. sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, New Zealand. Shout out to uh, Negus Tafari, uh, donation and super chat, thanking us. We're thanking you. Really appreciate that. Yes. But no, Rania, I thought this was a good point. You made that point about the international community earlier. It's like that map I've seen going around on social media where it's like, They've just put the ocean over everything that's not America, <laughs> Canada, Europe, and Australia. And it's yeah. like, this is the so-called international community, as they say, but the vast majority of people in the world are actually living in countries that are not signing up to this, you know, aggressive war drive and so on and so forth. And, you know, it really is, I, I think it is so notable how sanitized the conversation is here. I mean, you know, people can have whoever they want to have on. I, you know, it is what it is. There are a lot of different views. But just the fact that any discerning person working at any of these major media outlets, it would be very clear that there are many people around the world of stature who do not agree with the sort of U.S. Western perspective. And you'd think just from the point of view of just even just excitement, you know, just to sort of spice it up a little bit, you would throw some some contrary views in, let people hear yeah, the other side, maybe create a little views. dust that up would. or something like that. Like that's, you actually see, if you watch the Indian mainstream media on this, they've been, they'll bring in people who are like <laughs> 100% pro-America, 100% pro-Russia. And then it's like, this person hates Russia, this person loves Russia, fight. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly the way <laughs> to do it. But it just, you'd think something. But it's it's like yeah. not even the slightest hint, not even as like a punching bag type situation, do they bring in someone with the yeah. contrary view. Like not even to like beat up on you do they bring them in. It's just nothing at all to give people critical distance, which to me seems, at that point, it seems so so clear and obvious, it, it's deliberate. 
Oh, absolutely. It's 100% deliberate. I mean, it's not like CNN doesn't have a 24 hour channel with like a million producers <laughs> constantly calling people to come be guests. Like it's not a, it's not a mistake or an accident that everybody is like some think tanker from some weapons funded think tank or some, you know, uh, or some weapons industry funded like former general. Uh, that's not by accident. That is by design. And it's interesting, too, because I mean, at the same time, they have plenty of time and resources to put into, for example, CNN recently interviewed, like, I don't know if it was the head of the police in Kiev or right, right. somebody in like a security position, in the armed forces, maybe it was like a Ukrainian armed forces guy, but it turned out to be like a Nazi. <laughs> oh yeah, I think he was like, like the, the mayor of a small of the town. But yeah, and they no, 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 no. you talking about the one no, no, with the blurred out no. background? No, 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 no. This is new. This oh, is like another today. guy. I saw. Jesus. I didn't have a chance. Yeah, this is like <laughs> I saw it going around Twitter like today. Like it was like a sit down like interview talking to this guy who turned out to be a Nazi. It's like okay, so like you guys have all these resources. You have big teams on the ground, probably with huge security detail. But you can't like maybe Google this guy. I think, think it was so. by design. Yeah, like, it reminds me of uh, <laughs> when. Uh, <laughs> Reminds me when Jorge Ramos went to interview Maduro. Maduro was like, Jorge, you're not a journalist. You know this. Uh, and it's just, there's so many of these people that you think like, yeah, like they're running around talking about like we're journalists and they're not even attempting to do even the bare minimum. And honestly, that's all I'm asking for. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. CNN, MSNBC have to become, you know, rabid anti-imperialist platforms or whatever. It'd be great if, you know, they had a Damascene conversion to anti-imperialism, but I'm not saying that. But just just a just a slight opening, just a little something. You would think if you claim to have a free press, you claim to have democracy, you claim to want to show all these different views, and it's it's honestly like the exact opposite, opposite. of yeah. what takes place, and it really is just. Uh, it can be disheartening, but you know that's what we're here for at Breakthrough News yes. to yes. break through, if you will, uh, all of that <laughs> media spin. So don't forget, we are on Telegram now. You're at Breakthrough News, I believe, on Telegram. So you can check this out there at Breakthrough News. We are, of course, at BT Newsroom across all of your social media platforms, youtube.com slash Breakthrough News. That one you probably know because you're watching us right now. Um, and then also, of course, if you so choose, if you are, in fact, able, we would be deeply grateful if you could go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news, become a patron. Your patronage, very important to us, helps push our work forward here. So that's patreon.com slash breakthrough news. But definitely hit the subscribe, hit the bell so you get the alerts. We have tons of great stuff coming out on all of these various issues, a number of ra real true range of views. I think no one else is doing a better job than we are with the range of views on what's happening in Ukraine. And all of it is good. All of it you'll want to see, especially dispatches with Rania Kalik. Thank but you. also, of course, the freedom side, we will continue to bring you, you know, everything that seems relevant as we move forward. But I think, Rania, as always, that brings us to the end of the show. It was a pleasure to be here with you again. Always a pleasure. It's always my pleasure, Eugene. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. I didn't even say it right. I didn't it's even okay. make fun of what you say right. I'll get good it right thing, next Good time. thing we're here every week. You can mock me <laughs> next week. Uh, yeah. But for myself, for Rania, for our whole Breakthrough News team, we will see you next week. Gets in its way, gets in its way.